was a was was something that I think I kind of came back to a lot in those stories. They might not all fit that bill neatly, but they all kind of had that idea that the the uh, the supernatural was a background thing, like a like a sort of background light that kind of illuminated what was going the real point of the story. In the second collection, which is as you say much more overtly fantastical. Um, uh, basically, it was I was, you know, I didn't want to write any more of the stories that I'd written for the first book because I was kind of, you know, I'd just written a bunch of them. I was wanted something different. Uh, I didn't want to do the same thing twice. And coming into the first book, I had a real sort of, I was coming out of a time when I had a kind of a love hate relationship with the genre and and supernatural fiction. And uh, and so I think some of that played out in those first stories. By the time I wrote my second book, I was kind of diving headfirst back into it. Uh, I was like, "This is this is just stuff that I love," and so I wanted to play with all the fun stuff, you know, um, all the pulpy elements that I that I avoided in the first book, and so just that's how it kind of that second book came to be, and it sort of coalesced around the idea of hell and uh, kind of an inverted idea of what hell might actually be, but that was all just, you know, it was it was just playing in the playground as far as I was concerned. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely recommend both to those of you who may not have, have read them. They're both excellent um, and for very different reasons. Um, uh, and I, I think your second collection especially kind of uh, scratched that that Hellboy, Clive Barker itch, <laughs> you know, that I, that I needed. Big influences. Um, um, I did want to ask, uh, and and I, I this is true of both collections, but I I, I see it a, a lot, especially in the first one, um, but but in all of your work generally, um, is that you're you're really good at at uh, writing the working class, um, which it feels very very unusual. I I feel like um, a, a lot of uh, work when I come to it, um, you know, whether it's literary or where, whether it's genre, it tends to be very much rooted in, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class, right? That tends to be the kind of perspective. Um, and I think your, uh, one of the things that makes your work really powerful is that it has that kind of working class component. So, um, so I wanted to ask you, like, how, how much of that is intentional? How much of that is rooted in um, experience versus just, um, you know, interactions with other people or, or kind of your process related to that? Um, it was very intentional, especially with the, with the first book. Um, I, I, I had the same feeling that you just described yourself having a uh, reading genre at the time. Uh, a lot of, now this just comes from people, you know, a lot of the writers come from that sort of academic uh, middle class world. Uh, which is fine, but that's the world they know. So of course, that's what they that's what gets translated onto the page. And I felt like I wasn't reading about the sort of world that I knew or that I lived in, uh, unless I was reading outside genre. If I was reading like Southern Lit or uh, or you know, sort of things about poor people, just trying to just trying to make it through life. And uh, it was important to me because, uh, yeah, that's the world that I knew. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I wanted to see it represented on the page, and and so I did, you know. And and it's still important to me. Um, it's it's I th I think there's a, I think class is a thing that isn't talked a lot about, and uh, I think it there are still misunderstandings across that divide, and I think we're seeing that uh, in a very powerful way right now, like today, and. Uh, and it leads to it can lead to catastrophe um, again, as I think we're, we're seeing now. And uh, and and so I think it's important to. Uh, well, I think you know I've I've said before. I think one of the the most important, if not the most important, function of literature is to foster empathy in in people and you know, try to experience lives that we we don't experience in our, in our daily life. Um, and uh, and it's important to me to try to do that with, uh, with working class. Um, I, I think that's really interesting when, um, uh, when you say that the purpose is to foster empathy, because I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but I'm also intrigued by um, uh, the fact that you, you do 
uh, uh, or at least the work of yours that I've read, uh, falls primarily into very much the dark fiction, dark fantasy horror categories. And so how, how do you see those genres as um, uh, kind of tying into this idea of, of empathy? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think I write in those genres not so much because it's part of some plan that I have, but because it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's my heart's neighborhood, you know? It's, it's, it's what I've always loved. If what, it's a kind of world that I'm, the imaginative space I've always been in. I don't think I, I don't think I could not write that way. Or if I did, it would feel very unnatural. Um, and so, and so, if there are other things I want to write about, they just kind of naturally fall into that sphere. I think writing about, <clears throat> or rather, using the tools of uh, like horror fiction or dark fantasy or you know whatever you want to call. It, I think those two those tools can be applied to anything. I think they could be applied to, to romance, to crime, to uh, you know, Southern grit lit, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's, they're just, they're just that, they're tools that you can bring, you can bring to any project. Sorry, my cat is on my lap and she's mad at me. So that's what's distracting me. Oh yeah, no worries. I, I also, I uh, have uh, a couple of cats off of frame who are, who are doing likewise. So, um, yeah, so solidarity there. Um, I, I did want to uh, kind of follow up on that by asking uh, about influences or like, are there particular writers that you feel um, really helped shape you either imaginatively or in like finding your voice as a writer? Sure. Um, I think I'm always, I always want to be careful to say when I ask about influence that I think influence is ongoing and, uh, and, and one never stops being influenced. And it's natural to talk for writers to talk about writers who influence who have influenced them but they could also be much broader too right we're influenced by music and by you know a variety of things um having said all that uh the uh in speaking of genre uh massive influence is clive barker uh when i first i'd been reading king for many years before him and of course he is a kind of a bedrock influence like he is i think for many writers of uh my generation um but when I read Barker, it was, uh, it was, you know, it was like the lid had come off the sky. Uh, it was a different way of perceiving what horror fiction could be about, um, how it could be brought to bear uh, in literature. And by that specifically, I mean, I specifically mean um, that it was a transform, he uses it as a transformative literature rather than a in the traditional sort of horror story where you must uh, expunge the, the threat that is coming into your, into your world uh, and kind of restore the balance. Uh, for Barker, it's often a, something that is, it's a way that you can't, you can't push back against. It will overwhelm you and it will transform you. The transformation may be painful and bloody. It may transform you into something that is perceived as horrific by everything else around you, but it is also uh, kind of, a, Epiphany. It's a kind of a breaking through to a different, perhaps better state, and uh, that was that was mind-boggling to me. It was uh, I responded to it in a very positive, emotional way. It felt it felt very true. Um, you know, as someone who often felt like the monster walking around, uh, to 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 have that cast in that particular light was was uh, was very meaningful. Uh, Hemingway, I come back to a lot. Uh, he's a divisive writer, and understandably so for re various reasons. But uh, despite all of his faults, uh, I think he wrote some of the most beautiful short stories in the 20th century. Um, and uh, I, I still, I think of him as like a, a well of pure water. I have to come back to it every once in a while and just and just partake of that pure water sometimes, or and remember basic clean beauty of prose. And uh, Annie Proulx was a big one. Um, Richard Ford was a big one. Uh, and later on, uh, um, I'm blanking on his name all of a sudden, um, Clark Ashton Smith, the pulp writer. Uh, he, was, uh, he was just so volcanically strange. And, uh, and you know, when I read his stories, I just, I, I just really, really respond to that that bizarre energy. Uh, and of course, you've already mentioned uh, Mike Mignola. Uh, 
uh, also a big one. There, I could go on for like an hour probably. I, I think uh, those are perfect. Uh, and, and I'm actually, um, uh, it, it's, it's uh, kind of, kind of nice to hear you mention some of your influence and especially Hemingway, because that is also uh, someone that uh, Brian Evanson mentioned uh, the other day when we got to chat with him uh, as oh, influence as well. So, so I think, uh, yeah, there, uh, there may be something there <laughs> with, uh, uh, you know, uh, dark fiction writers and Hemingway. And <laughs> there's a thesis waiting to be written uh, someday. Um, I, I did uh, kind of want to ask about your, your choice of form because um, you, you've written two um, collections of short stories and, you know, which include short stories and, and uh, there's at least one novella or two novellas that I, uh, um, that I can think of. Um, yeah. And uh, is, that, is that a form that you feel creatively drawn to or, uh, or is it, you know, I, I, I guess how much of, of that is, is, you know, done by virtue of you're creatively drawn to it versus this is, this is what was needed at the time to fulfill a, um, you know, an editor's request and, and so on. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of both. Um, a lot of the stories were, were written for, uh, at an editor's invitation. That being said, I was writing short stories anyway. Uh, so uh some of it some of it was just a function of having to parcel out uh small bits of time and then finding it easier to uh focus on on uh on shorter works uh some of it was just that what i wanted to write to the time required a small space uh these kind of like short little uh, stabs of emotion just trying to uh trying to convey um, and some of it, I think, was just I didn't feel like I had, you know, the long breath uh, required for a novel. And I think I had to sort of work my work up my confidence to try something that long. And then maybe even also to come up with an idea that warranted that that length. Um, so it's it's funny. And I think I've, I've heard other writers say this kind of thing, too. The more they write, the longer they write and it becomes harder for them to write short. And that's where I find myself. Um, and I don't know if that's just me gaining confidence or if that's just a natural evolution. It's probably an unsatisfying answer, but, the, but frankly, I'm not really sure. It just seems to be the progress. And, and you're working on a, a novel right now, is that correct? Yes, I've finished one and I'm in the editing uh, phase of its life. And uh, and I, I'm writing I'm writing a second. I'm in the kind of first draft version of a of a second novel. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I definitely look forward to to reading those. Um, I I I do want to ask just because um, you're you're and you kind of talked about this with with you know Clark Ashton Smith and and so on. But um, especially in your second collection, collection uh, there is such a like. Even though the the subject matter is is dark and it can go to some like very tragic and emotional places, it uh, there's such a sense of fun and joy in it, almost strangely, um, it, you know, it, because it, especially for for readers coming to it after your first collection, um, and especially something like like uh, the butcher's table, uh, where you know you've got pirates and and angels and and like uh you know possessed octopuses and and uh, it's <laughs> a fantastic like uh trip of a novella and and i i guess i just wanted to um get a sense of uh what was it the same writer behind both or was the writer of the second collection just having more fun <laughs> I, uh both of those things are true uh i think it's I think, and I worried about this, what, you know, the same writer aspect of that. I, I worried a lot writing the second book uh, because the first was garnering some nice reviews and I was like, well, am I, am I short circuiting my career right at the get go by doing something very different for the second book? Um, but there was really no choice. It was, it was, those are the stories that had to be written. But, uh, but yeah, I like to think anyway that, uh, that they share a concern with um, dealing with compromised people 
Um, I have never in my life been interested in writing about good people or heroes. I've always been. Uh, or, uh, who are either internally compromised or were, had, were, were just unsympathetic because of decisions they had made or, or the circumstances they found themselves in. They're just more interesting to me. And so I think they share that. I think they share sympathy for uh, the, the anti-hero or the, or the villain, um, or at least if not a sympathy, then at least an, uh, an effort to kind of understand why they are who they are. And, uh, but, but yes, it was also a writer who was just having more fun. Uh, I, I didn't want to write stories that depressed me, uh, as much as I had the first time around, you know, I was looking for a different experience. And, uh, and like I say, they felt like, uh, I felt like, uh, I had avoided a lot of the, um, uh, the toys of the genre that are, that, that are, that are, that are fun. And I wanted to play with them in the second book. You know, I wanted the pirates. I wanted, uh, I wanted the, uh, the city, you know, run by ghouls and the, the vats with, uh, weird entities in them. You know, I wanted all that stuff. And, uh, a lot of that came from reading Mignola, actually. I was reading a lot of Mike Mignola, the Hellboy stories, uh, some of the various spinoffs. And I was just paging through it thinking at, at one, they're fantastic stories. They're emotional stories. They have real resonance. And he's just clearly throwing in everything he loves. I was like, that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> uh, just, you know, throw in what you love. And so I decided to do it. And uh, yeah, I was scared the whole time, especially when writing about pirates. I was like, this is, no one's going to buy this. Pirates, for God's sakes. But uh, I decided to go ahead and try anyway. Yeah, well, well, I think I, I would say it was definitely a success. And um, one of the things that that really interests me, um, both as just a, a reader and and um, as someone who tries to write, is just um, the idea that you can take some of um, I, I think you, uh, you you know like some of these genre tropes and some of these um, things that that are really imaginatively compelling, and then like rooting in them in something that feels very human and, and relatable. Um, so I, I guess if for students who might be kind of uh, in that place of maybe they're interested in genre fiction, but they don't know how to write it in a way that feels real or feels authentic, like do you have any advice or um, any particular approach that you use to find that balance? Well, the approach that I use, especially when I was doing, like in the first book, there was a vampire story and a werewolf story. Uh, you know, I, I used some, some of the, the, the classic monsters. The approach I used at the time was first to try to think of a different way of writing about that, um, uh, about that creature. You know, think about what, every, what everyone expects, because the thing about genre fiction is that there are a set of expectations that come along with it. And part of those expectations are why we love genre. There's a comfort to be found there. But it's also what lets us down with those kinds of stories so often. Um, I can't count how many stories I've read or movies I've seen in which the, uh, the first two thirds of it are very exciting and compelling and interesting. And then it clicks into the end game and it just hits all the beats you know it's gonna, it's gonna hit. And it's just like, okay, now it's following formula. We know exactly how it plays out. And it's so frustrating when that happens. And so think of something, think of a, a way to avoid doing that if possible. Uh, just turn it upside down, turn it on its head somehow. And, uh, and the second thing is, every character in the story has a point of view that, that they have to fundamentally believe in. And you have to believe in it with them. Even if it's somebody you don't like, when you're writing that character, you have to honor who they are. And uh, that means sometimes having them do or say things that you, you find troublesome. Um, and sometimes at the end, you wanna, you wanna veer them out of that uh, in order to make your story come to a more uh, pat uh, conclusion. Uh, but that's a cheat. I think you should not do that. And I think, and I think that's the thing. I think whether it's your monster, whether it's your protagonist or just a side character, honor their, who they are and honor their point of view and bring it to a very, bring it to a conclusion that is natural to them. And, uh, 
and you might get some surprising results sometimes from them. Thanks, Nathan. I um I I wanted to ask because you did mention some influences, um, but on on the opposite end of that, are there any um any writers you would recommend or people you're reading who you feel are are doing something interesting or or new, um, whether it's in genre or out of it? Um. Yes. Uh, yes. This question always trips me up because I try to grab for names and they're like little fish evading me. But uh, Livia Llewellyn is a big one. Livia Llewellyn writes in the genre. She is a uh, she is a horror writer, dark fantasy writer. Her short stories are very intense, very beautifully, sometimes even baroquely written. Um, extremely dark and. Uh, and I think some of the most striking and extraordinary short horror fiction being written today. Uh, she's got two collections out, um, Engines of Desire and Furnace. I would recommend them both very highly. Uh, there is a writer of um, kind of what I think of as like Southern Gothic fiction, uh, Julia Elliott. Uh, she has a book of short stories out called The Wilds, which I highly recommend. It is not genre, but it's kind of like, it sits next to it. And uh, it's, uh, Lush, beautiful, and strange. Um, some of these uh, names, I'm sure you, you're, you're, you and your uh, whoever's listening will already know. Uh, Karen Russell is another big one. Uh, Karen Russell wrote a book. She's written a few books now, but the one that really knocked me flat was uh, her first collection of stories called uh, "St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves." It was just a just a sledgehammer of of uh, same kind of thing. You know, I, I have a theme here beautiful, strange, uh, dreamlike stories um, that were not like anything else I had read at the time. Uh, I still think about them and, and like the, the hairs in my arms uh, lift. Uh, those are the ones that come to the mind immediately. I, 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 I recommend them thoroughly. Fantastic. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I, and um, you'd, you'd mentioned um, kind of speaking of new writers, and you mentioned a few, but also going back to, um, you know, thinking about Clive Barker versus Hemingway as some influences, and even maybe even somebody like Livia Llewellyn versus, you know, um, some of the other writers. Um, uh, the idea of like Baroque prose versus the, like the very like sparse minimalist prose of, of somebody like, like Hemingway. Um, and so, um, do you, as a stylist, do you feel drawn to one approach more than the other in terms of how you approach um, writing prose itself? No, mm, that's not a good question. Uh, I, I used to be, I would say, I would much, much more preferred the kind of like lush, uh, ornate prose. Uh, not so much anymore. Uh, I used to also want to write that more than I do these days. Uh, I think that's also another thing that happens to a lot of writers as they age they tend to want to be more spare. Um, I love beautiful prose, but I think that beautiful prose can be, can be clean. You know, the clean unadorned prose can be gorgeous. Uh, I think Hemingway wrote, he has this reputation of being the staccato sentence writer. And, and there are stories in which he is very much that kind of writer. But if you read some of his earlier stories, he's not. He, but he's still, you know, sentences might go on for, you know, half a page, but they're still, very clean, like bone thin, and uh, and they're uh, and they're gorgeous. They're like they're like they're like uh, little pieces of art, and uh, I feel that way with some of uh, Richard Ford's prose as well. Um, so spare, clean prose is uh, is also beautiful. But it, it yeah, it's I, I this is probably another unsatisfactory answer. I, I like beauty in prose. I don't like the prose to be. I don't mind what they call window pane prose. If the story's good, it'll carry me along just fine. I have no issues. Plenty of writers I like write that way. But what really makes me sit up and take, make attention is, is beauty. And that doesn't have to be ornate. You know, it doesn't have to be lush. It can be very clean and spare too. Um, but I think that's harder to, to achieve. And I think it's also harder to describe. Because if you ask me what I, specifically what I meant, I don't know that I'd be able to articulate it very well. 
Yeah, and, and that's totally okay. I, I think it's worthwhile just to hear that um, that beautiful prose can take on different forms, um, especially for um, students who are are still trying to find their voice and trying to find um, uh, you know different ways of, of writing um, and and how you write. Um, so I I did want to you know we'd already mentioned kind of the the uh, some of the differences between the the collections and um, you know how how you approached each as as a writer. Do you do you feel like with your um, with your novels or with your newest work that you see yourself like evolving in new directions or are you revisiting um, uh, like like earlier obsessions in new ways or um, how or, or and it may be something that is still so new that maybe it hasn't you, you aren't aware of it yet but uh, but I did kind of want to ask how much of that is kind of percolating. It does feel new. The next book is called uh, The Strange and it's about uh, a girl on Mars in 1930, and it definitely feels very different from both of the first books. You know, it's not a it's not a horror novel, although there are those those colors in it here and there. Uh, there are elements of that sometimes, but that's not what it's about. It's not what it's trying to be, and uh, and so that feels different. And uh, it's told from the point of view of a younger person, which is not a point of view I usually you know inhabit. And um, that being said, though, it's cosmetically quite different. Uh, it is still addressing, you know, the themes that I find myself returning to again and again. Um, the places love takes us, uh, anger and isolation, parent-child relationships, which I seem to be coming back to all the time. And um, it's, it's full of that. And the one that I'm writing now the the one that's still like in very very uh rough stages is uh again a parent child relationship uh it's set in the modern world it's contemporary but it's at least right now it seems to be kind of suffused with a sort of uh dreamlike strangeness that i'm going to try to maintain and you know ebb and flow at various points but um so it's probably too late for me to speak with any authority on that one, but uh, uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's at once different and then it's it's taking on a different shape, but it's 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 full of the themes that I, you know, apparently am obsessed by. Yeah, no, and I I think that's um, like super important just to because um, uh, I'm always really fascinated by by talking to authors and and hearing about. Um, their obsessions or, or their themes that that really draw them um, and because especially because I think you see it I, I think you pick it up a lot easier uh, with directors than writers just because it's so visual and it sticks out to you right like yeah. like everybody knows what a Tim Burton movie looks like even if they're you know even even if they vary wildly from one to the other it's like you can you can tell like some of the the themes and obsessions are there so so I always find it kind of interesting to to ask about that um, uh, and I'm also really fascinated by the the Mars novel, just um, and the way you describe it. It sounds like you're doing um, a lot of new things, um, you know, with the youthful protagonist and the setting and all of that. Um, how, I guess, every time you approach a story, like like what is that like? Is it is it nerve wracking? Is it like do you go in with confidence? I guess like when you're doing something new like that, that feels. Um, I go, yeah, I go with excitement um, because it feels new. It feels different, and uh, it's like uh, it feels like a, I don't know. It feels like uh, going to uh, going to a carnival or something when you're a kid. It's like this is it's full of uh, bright lights and things are moving and everything is mysterious and looks exciting and fun, and that's how it feels going in. It's like oh, this is. This is Mars. This is going to be great. I want to write about Mars. And then, of course, you get into it, and it's like it's just the same old slog writing always is. But uh, but but I go in with excitement, and uh, and if I'm lucky, uh, an an element of that excitement will stay with me, and I'll be able to follow follow it out of the maze of all the complications, and uh, and I might still be excited at the end of it, um, and uh, or at least rediscover my excitement that's probably more accurate and um 
yeah, it's a, there's a little bit of trepidation going in because again, it's a different thing. Although I felt it less this time. The first time I was sick, I was thinking about how others were going to perceive the books, which is a dead end for a writer. And you should try to avoid thinking that way, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not, po not possible to avoid it. And I, so I was worried about writing a, a book that was too different, that was going to disappoint people. Um, but the book did okay. And, uh, and it also set a precedent so that I can do something different again. Um, and when the third book comes out, which is yet another change, that's a new pattern set. So now I feel less restricted going, for, going forward. I've set the precedent if I can move around a little bit and uh, people won't just expect me to do North American Lake Monsters over and over again. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, in the past year, you've had uh, a film adaptation of The Visible Filth and also the Hulu series, um, which was just released a few weeks ago, um, uh, Monsterland. Um, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk maybe a little bit about that. Like, how did like how did that come about, and and was that uh, like what was that experience like of of having your work adapted for for the big screen and or the little screen? It was incredible. Um, yeah, I've been very lucky, uh, very very lucky. Um, it came about when uh, the first book, North America Light Monsters, had been out for a couple of years. I would get nibbles every once in a while of people expressing interest. Um, usually these were folks uh, who were in my position in the world. They had no clout, they had no money, they were just trying to make something. And, uh, and I was sympathetic to that, but I was also uh, thinking I've got a kid who's gonna be going into college in a couple of years, um, and I need to be careful not to do anything. I need to make sure I'm doing this you know, smart. And so I got my, uh, I, call, I emailed my publisher who put me in touch with, um, well, who got in touch with Joe Hill. And uh, through that, I got in touch with his film agent um, who I signed on with. And once I signed on with him, uh, things started happening. You know, he, he emailed, uh, he got me in touch with uh, Babak Anvari who made Under the Shadow, uh, an Iranian, a beautiful Iranian horror film. Um, and he wanted to do the visible filth and that became the movie wounds. And while he was writing that screenplay, he read North American Lake monsters and wanted to option that as well for the TV show. And that ended up happening, you know, too, which is just, you know, like I say, extraordinarily lucky. And it was a, it was life changing in that, in that it, I felt, and this is kind of silly. I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but, um, I felt validated and you shouldn't need that to feel validated. You absolutely should not. But at, up until that point, whenever I was talking to other writers or, or in a room with other writers, I would feel, you know, I would have the imposter syndrome. I would feel like I didn't really belong, that I was like, uh, you know, a satellite. But once that happened, I felt like, well, at least maybe now, maybe now I'm a real writer. Uh, which again, I reiterate, is very silly. Uh, it has nothing to do with it but that's how I felt about it anyway. It made me take myself a little more seriously. Um, I don't think that's silly at all. Uh, I think that's actually uh, strangely very comforting to hear. <laughs> um, <laughs> was, was, it, was it surreal to, to see your words translated to the screen and, and to have them embodied in actors and in, in scenes and stuff or? Um, it was, it was very bizarre. Um, I remember the, you know, the first time I really kind of felt that, that, that that sense of strangeness was uh, when I got to see the movie the, for the first time uh, at Sundance and it was after midnight and I was watching this and there was a, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Dakota Johnson uh, saying words I had written while I was, you know, this, you know, slouched on my couch one day uh, with a laptop. And I was like, that's just, how can this be happening? Yeah, I felt like I stepped into someone else's life for a few minutes. Wow. Well, so, um, Nathan, I, I want to be mindful of your time, and and you've been so generous with it. Um, so I, th I think we're going to wrap up here. But I wanted to okay. give you a few minutes to um, um, tell us about 
anything new that you have that's coming out. Um, we've mentioned the collections um, and um, those are available at the library if you want to check them out. Um, and al I also wanted to ask about, um, you know, any stories you have coming up or collections or anything else uh, kind of on the horizon that we might um, watch out for. No, actually, I don't have a story. All the stories I've written have, have come out. Um, so I'm in this period where I've got to generate something. Uh, the next thing coming out will, of course, uh, probably be the novel. Um, I believe that's scheduled for early 2022, so that's still a little ways off. But um, I'm working on a story. There's a story in the wounds called The Atlas of Hell, um, which is about a character who's, who deals in, in rare books and and gets caught up with the, the mob. I thought he'd be an interesting character kind of kind of revisit in a sort of serial, serial fiction kind of way, like a pulp sort of way. So I'm writing a couple of novellas featuring him. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's some short stories that are, that are just about finished. I need to polish them up and send them out there, but they don't have homes yet. So I, I can't say where they'll eventually be. Oh, no worries. This is a really boring answer to your question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, I think it's a good answer because it, it, I think it gives folks like a glimpse, like at, at like how this really like operates, right? Like, like the life of a writer. Um, yeah, I, it's I, a long process. Just as, as a, as a reader, um, because I love the butcher's uh, table so much, do you plan on revisiting that setting again and I do. Uh, that actually, that that story ties in with the uh, the Atlas of Hell. There's a there's a very connect, strong connection there, even though they're in different time periods. And so, with these novellas I'm writing about that character, and there'll definitely be some some uh, some significant ties to the Butcher's Table. And there's also I'm also thinking about this character called uh, Jenny the Roach, who would be a, a character who lives in a a port town uh, that would exist in the butcher's table milieu. Um, she'd be sort of like a, a a gang leader. So I don't know. There are uh, yeah, answer is yes, but an abstract yes. No, that's perfect. You you had me you had me at Jenny the Roach. Um, that sounds great. Uh, and and I also I I think I remember seeing that you either were working on or, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the title, but, um, cause I initially thought it was going to be published in, in Wounds. Um, something about the spiders on the moon or I, I'm <laughs> probably misremembering that, but. Spider Kings of the Moon. Yeah, that was originally, that was a, it's a long short story or novella. It's, I'm revising it. It didn't, it was going to be in Wounds. I pulled that out the last minute cause I wasn't happy with it. But then it's going to be the first and what I think are going to be three of what I call uh, lunar gothics, which are uh, gothic stories set on various moons in the solar system. And uh, yeah, I, I, that's a very weird one. Um, uh, I quite like it. Uh, I don't know if other people will, but uh, yeah, I hope to uh, I hope to have that out in the, out in the world soon. Hopefully next year. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, I love your stuff. I, I, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, Lucia Shepard stuff, honestly, um, who's another oh. I just have an enormous amount of respect for. Love Lucia Shepard, yeah. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for your time and for chatting with us and for, yeah, just having a conversation. I uh, really, really appreciate it. It was fun. I, I, I'm, I'm really glad you asked me. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.